of the world. Uh, we know someday Jesus is coming back and we're going to meet him in the air and, um, and uh, so we know there is the second coming and, and uh, uh, but a lot of the scriptures a lot of people use to talk about the uh, future have already been fulfilled and so we've been talk, talking about that and uh, uh, last week I was gone and David was here and he did a good job of doing a history uh, overview of, of, of uh, just how some of these things came and entered into the thinking process of, of the church and uh, if you haven't watched that be good to, to hear that because he did a good job of kind of tying things together and uh, it's good to be a, a, a student of history uh, because it, it tells you, it, for a lot of reasons, not just for, for Christian reasons, but just uh, history has a, has a way of repeating itself. And so it's always good to kind of pay attention to those things about history. So anyway, uh, it was good. I, uh, I enjoyed listen, listening to it. So we're going to jump right in, and uh, we have quite a ways I want to try to get accomplished here. But... Uh, it's one of these things that we've heard so much that we have to hit some of these points because we've heard a lot. And um, so I want to do hit on some things. Just as a way of review, a couple of weeks ago we talked about Daniel 9. And uh, that is a prophetic uh, scripture that the Lord uh, gave Daniel. And it is an amazing, amazing prophecy because uh, four or five hundred years before Jesus was born, the Holy Spirit revealed to Daniel when, you know, the time frame of the Messiah, and it came to pass just like he, like it said in the in the scripture. And so, you know, if you want proof that the Bible is true, there is a scripture you can use uh, for those who doubt, because nobody can do that. And uh, so, um, and, and in Daniel, God gave Israel or the Jewish nation 490 years, and it, we talked about that. And uh, it was a prophecy that foretold the coming of the Messiah, his death, and the destruction of Jerusalem. And um, so we, we looked at that. But we're going to jump in. We we're kind of in the middle of Matthew 24. We're going to go to Matthew 24, 15, and we will start there. Um, Matthew 24, 15. And, it's, you know, we've been talking about Jesus is talking to his disciples about uh things that are going to happen to that generation and things that are shortly going to come to pass. And uh, so we're going to start in on verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And so we talked about that. That refers back to the Daniel prophecy. And Jesus is, return, is referring to that and say, when you see this, when you see this happening, that he's given them instructions. And in Luke, it talks about that when you see the armies surround Jerusalem, flee to the hills, do this. So he's warning them and he's warning the people at that time what's going to happen. And so then he goes on to say, when you see this, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. And we'll stop there for right now. Uh, so he's telling them, when you see these things, you know, go. If you're in the field, don't, don't go back to your house. Take out real quick. And the reason Jesus told them that is because there was a, a, a real short window of opportunity for the Christians or the believers to get out of Jerusalem before it was destroyed. And in AD 70, Jerusalem was completely destroyed um, and the temple was destroyed. And um, for four months, there was uh, the army surrounded and starved the people. But before that happened, there was a short window of opportunity for the believers to get out of Jerusalem. So Jesus is warning the believers, when you see this, don't go back to your house. And your tendency would be run, run to your house. But he said, get out and get out quickly. And, you know, woe if, you, you know, it's, and it's really, you know, if you're with baby or, you know, it's going to be tough. But 
So he was giving them these, these warnings. Um, and according to Josephus, who was a historian, a Jewish historian, he wasn't a Christian, but he was hired by the Roman army, I mean the Roman Empire, to be an historian of that time. And um, uh, he, he recorded a lot of these events. And he is well accepted uh, in Christian circles and secular circles. He's, I mean, he's, he's a, a very accepted historian. And he wrote in his writings that not one Christian was killed, that they all got out, and that he observed that. So they had that short window of opportunity. So he's saying, when you see this, get out. Now, I want to point out, and the reason I'm pointing this out, it's talking to the people in Judea. And it's talking to the... Uh, people who are accustomed to the Sabbath. So he's talking to the Jewish people. And that's important because futurists will say this is sometime in our future and the, in the Great Tribulation. And, you know, if this, when this happens, this is going to happen all over the world. But Jesus isn't talking to the world. He's talking to those in Judea. So he is setting the perimeters. He's setting the time perimeters. And he's setting to who he's talking to. So he, he, he sets that. And... Uh, and so you have this in the, the, there was four months that the army surrounded and just starved them out. And, uh, and then they, the army just descended like a flood of people upon, upon Jerusalem. So let's go on. Then in verse uh, 21, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been uh, since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And uh, I want to go, um, because this is what um, people refer to, the futurists refer to, or you've heard the great tribulation that's to come. This is where they get this verse is the, excuse me, this great tribu, tribulation. So I want to read from this out of Victorious Eschatology. Um, in reality, Jesus was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. He was answering the disciples' questions, when will Jerusalem and the temple be destroyed? If indeed Jesus was talking about the events of A.D. 70, then we have another question to answer. How could he have said that nothing so terrible had occurred since the beginning of the world until now or ever will? Haven't there been more wicked things happened than the destruction of Jerusalem? What about the 20th century Holocaust when 6 million Jews were murdered? What about the times of war and mass destruction? The destruction of Jerusalem was not the greatest in magnitude, but Jesus was talking in terms of it being the greatest calamity in the sense of suffering and anguish. Josephus, that's that historian, described for us what actually took place in A.D. 70. The city was sealed off by the Roman soldiers. Josephus tells how the Jews committed terrible atrocities to each other, even horrific actions such as cannibalism, which occurred during the famine. He narrates a vile account of a woman murdering her small son, cooking him, eating half of him, then arguing with thieves who broke into her house looking for food as to who would eat the other half. While the Romans had Jerusalem sealed off so no one could escape, the famine got so severe that many tried to sneak out under cover of darkness. Those daring but starving Jews sometimes swallowed diamonds and precious stones in hopes of escaping to a different region. Knowing this, the Roman soldiers would, would capture individuals coming from out of the city and cut open their stomachs and entrails, searching for whatever they could find. I'm sorry that this is so graphic, but if you're going to understand that this was... You, you need to understand what really went on to understand the magnitude... Eventually, General Titus, and he's of the Roman, Roman Empire, put an end to those searchings, but a new form of torture began. Josephus wrote that as the men tried to escape the city or to crawl out to gather food, the Roman soldiers would cut off their hands and send them back into the city. 
When the Roman soldiers finally were given the order to descend upon Jerusalem, Josephus tells us that more than 500 men were caught per day, then whipped, tortured, and crucified. Men were nailed to crosses in front of the city until there was no more space. Finally, the soldiers entered the city, and every person was killed except 97,000, who were taken away to be slaves in the Egyptian mines or as gifts to various providences so that they might be killed in the theaters. When Jerusalem was destroyed, a genocide of Jews was triggered throughout the surrounding regions. Josephus said, There was not one Syrian city which did not slay their Jewish inhabitants and were not more bitter enemies to us than were the Romans themselves. History provides many similar reports of what took place throughout the whole Roman Empire. When we compare the genocide of AD 70 to the Jewish Holocaust of the 20th century, we must admit that more recent Holocaust was greater in number with six million Jews killed over a six year period. Living in labor camps and being killed with poisonous gas was her horrific, but as far as we know, no one was crucified. In AD 70, more than one million Jews were starved, tortured, and killed in four month period. Despite the 20th century Holocaust larger magnitude, the violence during the AD 70 tribulation ended the lives of a much greater percentage of a Jewish population and was far more extreme in the atrocities that were committed. So, uh, uh, and when you get into the writings of Josephus, he even gives a lot more. But so Jesus was saying there would never be anything uh, like this or ever will be. The Jews lost their identity. Um, and they, uh, they were also, because the temple was destroyed, their whole way of worship was ended. And to the Jews, their whole way of approaching God was gone. You know, it was demolished. And so it was, it, you know, the, the uh, culture impact. And you can see why it says if the days weren't shortened because um, they, that probably every Jew around would have been uh, killed because it was spreading out from there. It was kind of like just open season on the Jewish people. And um, I want to point out that yeah, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The elect there can be translated the, the chosen ones. And, you know, the, the believers got out and uh, were hiding, but they were still Jewish people. And uh, if, if things didn't get shut down, which they did, you know, they may have eventually been found and killed also. So you can, you can see... Um, and you know that's and that's what they call the great tribulation, and you know also in some of the other things that I've read and uh, the the atrocities that they did to each other, it was um, the worst of humanity being loosed upon humanity. How they treated each other um, was just terrible. It was just like it uh, the worst of the worst came out, and. Um, so there's just a lot of those things going on. But it's interesting for us that there's a great promise here in that Jesus promised that there will never be a tribulation like that again. Now we've had wars that have been terrible and, and, and terrible things and there's been isolated uh, pockets of atrocities and terrible things. But to have this kind of magnitude, Jesus says there never will be again. And it, it's kind of... It's just like the devil. Here's a promise from God, you know, just like the, the rainbow was that they would never flood us again. Um, I can rem remember a, f a story about that. One of the little kids in school, you know, was, I think my sister was talking and said, you know, that God promised he would never, you know, there would never be this great flood again. But he, but the little kid, he was just a little one. He said, but he never promised that he just wouldn't cover us all up with snow. So, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, here's a promise that this is never going to happen again, and yet the devil has used that as a fear tactic. And you can get around in certain camps, and they'll say, you know, the great tribulation. 
and they begin to tell you how bad it's going to be and all these things and it just scares the willies out of you but when you realize that it's already happened and there's a promise that will never happen and I, and I know there's wars and different things but on that scale that'll never happen and so we have this promise that's been given to us but the enemy has used it to try to turn it around and then try to terrify believers um, and so you know it's just interesting to see how the devil the devil works so going on um, in verse 20 23 if anyone says so he you know he said let those days be short and then he goes on to say then if anyone says to you look here is the Christ or there do not believe it for false Christ and false prophets will arise and and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the elect see that I have told you beforehand you know and he's, he's talking to these people say he says I'm telling you, this is going to happen, and I'm telling you now. Uh, therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For where the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Okay, the faults false Christ. We talked a little bit about this before, but because of the prophecy, because of what was in the Bible, people were looking for the Messiah. And so there was a lots of so be so called messiahs around and people and false prophets trying to um, deceive people. And you see that in the writings of the New Testament. You know, there's so much of the New Testament that's written, beware of false prophets. Uh, watch out for the deceivers. You know they come in like like sheep, but they're really wolves. And there was a lot of false doctrine issues that they were having. Uh, Gnosticism, uh, believing that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, was a very prevalent belief. And so they had to, to battle all this. And remember, they didn't have the New Testament. They are, uh, and they they didn't have this all written down in a Bible. So you know that a lot of the New Testament hadn't been written nor did the early Christians even have that. So there was real opportunity for the enemy to come in and try to deceive because um, of just trying to communicate. And so that's why you have the letters uh, from the, the different apostles and writing trying to counter some of this and get the truth out there. But we know from history that there was a lot of false prophets. And, and, and interesting, and, and I don't know what to tell you other than this is what they recorded. Josephus uh, uh, wrote down that there were great signs, and he said extraordinary signs. Uh, a star resembling a sword appeared over Jerusalem, and then there was a light around the temple for a half hour. And so I suspect when these things happened, uh, for whatever reason, um, these guys tried to use that to their advantage. You know, look, you know, look at this. This is a sign. Uh, that you know you're supposed to follow me but Jesus clearly tells them don't follow him now is there application for us today absolutely from all of these scriptures there's, there's application and warnings the things that we can watch out for but you know as a as a whole and when people get saved and because of the teaching you know it's it's pretty easy to spot a false prophet and I know there's still those who follow him but this was a big problem at this time a big influence upon the church so Jesus is telling them don't believe him. You know, it's, I'm not in the desert. And then he makes this thing that, that it'll be like lightning from the east to the west. And it's really just saying it's going to be obvious. You can't hide lightning. That it's, it's not going to be in the secret place. It's not going to be something that's hidden. You're going to know. It's going to be very, very well known. And so he's telling them that just like that, so will the Son of Man that's coming. Um, in verse 24, false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, even possible, even the elect. This is another verse that is really used to bring fear. And I've heard this, you know, preach this this way, but not, not here, but... Uh, when this great, this future great tribulation comes, the futurists talk about, 
that it's going to be so bad that even the elect, if possible, will fall away. And the elect, again, is the, the chosen and uh, the believers. And so that's another thing, that it's going to be so bad. So you really don't know. You might be, you might be one of them who, who falls away because, he, if possible, even the elect. But when you see who this is written to, to those people at that time and the circumstances for which it is written, and it's still, I mean, there is application for today, but when you see that the pickle they were in, this is a perilous time. I am so glad I was not part of the early church because we didn't, you wouldn't have had a Bible um, and the, the, the letters, you know, they're coming slow in from John and <laughs> Paul and this is a rough time, a rough time in history with the Roman Empire. I mean, it's not a good time to live. And what he's saying, if possible, which really it's not possible if they would just pay attention to Jesus. And evidently they did. There's not one Christian, you know, died. They got out. So when, when you hear the scripture used to bring fear, it really was written to a different people. And, it, and, it, it, and they infer that it's going to be so bad that you're going to, you know, that it's going to be that way. Well, uh, that's already happened. Now, we all have to not deny Christ. But it's important to not let this scripture be used to try to f make you be fearful about the future. Does that make sense? Anybody going to nod their heads on that? Has anybody ever heard that as a fear tactic? And so, you know, we, we, we're starting to begin to see that the church is in a much better position than maybe we thought we were. And like I've been saying, once the church figures out that who she is and that our future is much brighter than what we thought, we're going to take some territory and not just give up on some things and not let, because whatever of, of, of that's fear, we know is not of the Lord. And so when we hear these things, you know, it brings fear. You know, there's people who are afraid to bring kids into the world. They're afraid of what's going to happen. This is some of the, this is some of the scriptures that the futurists use to, and, uh, and it brings fear to us, and the enemy uh, uses them, okay? Um, then it goes on to say, so, you know, and even today, if somebody says there are, Jesus is coming in the desert, don't go. There's not going to be any secret coming. Uh, because when he, sh you know, it's, uh, and there's people who try to get you to follow them. We know not to follow them because Jesus told us not to. But then it says, for wherever the car carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now that just seems like Jesus just went off talking about birds in the middle of this. And <laughs> what is he talking about? You got to remember, and one of the important things you have to, to, to understand some of this, you've got to learn some of the prophetic language of the Bible. And so when he talks about this, he, he's actually referring back to Ezekiel, but, but the emblem on the Roman army, on their flags, was the vulture. And in their, in their time, an eagle and a vulture was the same thing. And actually they kind of are. When we went to Alaska, I'd never seen so many eagles in all my life. I mean, they're just all over the place. And there are vultures. Or you can go out to the feedlot if you want to go out here. And they're around. They're a vulture kind of bird. They, and they come in. They were the place when we got off the, the cruise ship, the place they said to go see the eagles because all the, the tourists, oh, we want to see eagles. Go down to the county, down to the dump because that's where the eagles are. <laughs> And so that's, their, that's where they go. That, so they're, a, you know, they're, they're like a vulture. But the Roman army emblem on their flags was eagle. And so when you read this and you know of the devastation of, of AD 70, where all these people are killed, where the carcasses are, then you see and where the eagles will be gathered together. And so Jesus was warning them this is going to be the coming destruction in 70 AD. And, uh, you're, and so can you imagine you're, you're seeing the armies begin to surround Jerusalem. You, you've heard what Jesus said or, or maybe it was passed down and shared. When you see the army surround Jerusalem, run to the hills, get out. Don't go down, get your clothes, get out, of, get out now. 
and they see this army surround, and there's all these banners, and there's eagles on those banners. And they remember what Jesus said, that where the carcasses are, there'll be that the eagles are gathering. And so it's a warning. He was, I mean, he was giving them lots of information of what to do and what to watch for. And, that, and, that, and they knew to get out. Everybody with me? Lost anybody? Okay. So then we go on to Matthew 24, 29. Now again, I'll refer back to the future and say all of this stuff is in the future, in, our, in either our future or in a future generation. You know, back in the 70s, this was going to happen within just a little bit of time. And uh, I, I was out teaching at um, Karis Bible College, and I, I dabbled in this a little bit, threw a little bait out there. But there were people there that remembered, and uh, not. Uh, and I said something about how that's how in the 70s we, the 70s and 80s we thought Jesus was going to be back in 10, 15 years. I mean, it was everything was coming in the way the in, but and the 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 fear of what was going to happen, the tribulation, and and uh, the elect they're probably going to, you know, fall and. And uh, all of this was going to happen. And now we're many years later and it hadn't happened. And people remembered that, but they also remembered the fear and how there was a couple there. I mean, they were shaking their head like how it uh, paralyzed the church. It just stopped the church. And uh, evidently they were in some, some groups that, that, that were, they were very aware of that. So anyway, you know, bringing this out is that uh, it begins to, give you a different viewpoint or uh, give you a choice of what you want to believe and when you see it's already been fulfilled that it's already been done and uh, you go well that's been over so we need to re re -look at, rethink things so we go on to verse 29 and it says immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, for they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay. So as we look at that, um, we, first off, we know that this is going to happen immediately after the tribulation. Not after a long time, but immediately this is going to happen. So we know the great tribulation uh, that, that the Bible talks about the great tribulation happened in A.D. 70. So what did this, what happened immediately? And I want to um, read to you again from this uh, victorious exotology. And um, I just think um, they say it really well. To understand this passage, first notice the time frame that Jesus said, uh, Jesus said these things would happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. Since the tribulation that Jesus described happened in AD 70, we should look for the fulfillment of this verse immediately after AD 70. To see the fulfillment, we need to be familiar with certain Jewish idioms. The sun, the moon, and the stars frequently were used to refer to governing authorities. For example, Joseph had a dream in which the sun, moon, and stars all bowed down to him. Genesis 37, 9. When Joseph relayed this dream to his family, they did not cut they did not conduct, conclude that the sun, moon, and stars would literally bow, but that Joseph would be raised above governing authorities. Similarly, we can read in Revelation 12.1, a woman appears with the sun and moon under her feet and a crown of stars on her head, meaning she would, had great authority. So we can see how Jewish people use stars in figurative ways to refer to governing authorities. In modern times, we often use the word star 
in a figurative way, such as we refer to a, a movie star, sports star, or a superstar. In biblical terminology, the fame and glory of large cities were said to shine as the sun, moon, or stars. When a certain city was destroyed, the sun, moon, or stars were said to be darkened. For example, in the book of Ezekiel, we can read that the judgment coming after the destruction of Egypt, Ezekiel 32, 7, and when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens with darken and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you, and I will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. The destruction that was prophesied by Ezekiel happened to Egypt, but there is no record of the sun, moon, stars literally going dark. We can understand when we realize that prophets sometimes spoke in this apocalyptic terminology, we can compare it to the modern day idioms that people may use when tragedy strikes. His life caved in around him. They pulled the rug out from under him. The sky is falling. The lights went out. It may be difficult for modern day Christians to think Jesus using such terminology, but that's exactly what he did. In fact, that is the only way we find this terminology used anywhere else in the Bible. It was a Jewish idiom in re reference to coming destruction and the transfer of authority. Consider how Isaiah decreed destruction upon a region south of Israel known as Edom. And this is Isaiah 34. All the host of heaven will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a, a scroll. All their hosts will also wither away, as a leaf withers from the vine, or one withers from a, the fig tree. For my word is saturated in, uh, saturated in heaven, situated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom, and upon the people who I have devoted to destruction. At this time in history, the sky was not literally rolled up like a, a scroll. The host of heaven did not literally fall to the ground as leaves from a fig tree. Yet Edom was destroyed. Fi finally, God consider God's declaration of judgment through Isaiah upon Babylon. From Isaiah 13. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed, shed its light. When Babylon was judged, there was no record of stars and constellations ceasing from shining. The sun was not dark when it came up. The moon did not dim, yet destruction came. If we're going to allow the Bible to interpret itself, we will conclude that Jesus was using apocalyptic language to declare destruction. Just as I, prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel spoke judgments against Egypt, Edom, and Babylon, so also Jesus, a prophet, declared destruction upon Jerusalem. The disciples of Jesus would have recognized this phraseology. They knew the Old Testament. Such terminology was part of their culture expression. This fits perfectly with what actually took place after Jesus died, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. He was given all authority over heaven and earth. The evidence on earth of Jesus ruling in heaven was the old temple was destroyed. There was a new high priest sitting in heaven. There was a new ruler, King of kings and Lord of lords. And the heavens were shaken because Jesus Christ came into his kingdom. So when you... Um, look at what, how the Bible interprets this. Um, you can say, well, it, when it says that, um, that the, the moon, that the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light, it's talking about judgment and it's upon the, uh, the authority over Jerusalem that that city was going to be destroyed. Now, you say, why are you telling us all this? Because the futurists say all of this is literally going to happen. 
that it's going to be like this, that things are going to be so bad. And so uh, you've got to, to say, well, is it actually going to be that way? Uh, so you have to understand that kind of, kind of language. Also, which is interesting out of Hebrews, and Hebrews was written before the destruction of AD 70, and Hebrews was written really preparing believers and, and as a testimony that the temple and that and the sacrifice worship was not going to be anymore and it talks a lot about that what you know Jesus was the one final sacrifice and he gets into all of that but it says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 27 now this yet uh, yet once more indicates the removal of things that are being shaken as of things that are made the things which cannot be shaken may remain therefore since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptedly and with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. This is a scripture that, you know, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And we, we've heard that. Well, that's exactly what happened with Jerusalem. There was a shaking that went on and the old temple worship and all of that could be shaken because now we have a new covenant and it was, it was destroyed and the new covenant is the thing that stood. And so Hebrews was beginning to, to tell us about that, that this shaking that's going to happen. And that was a shaking over Jerusalem. Um, then we get into verse 30. So we, we see in verse 29, you know, it, it's, it's not talking about actual stars falling, but it's talking about uh, cities falling, judgment coming. And then, then it says in verse 30, then the sign of the sun the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then the tribes of the earth will mourn, for they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. In this, um, you know, the, the, remember at the beginning of the chapter, the disciples asked, uh, when will, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And when we talked about it, they weren't expecting Jesus even to die. They were expecting this new kingdom to be set up. And what they were talking about the end of the age wasn't like, it's not the end of the world, but they knew that, that Jesus was coming with a new kingdom. So when's the end of this old kingdom? When's the end of the Mosaic law? When's this going to change? So this, Jesus is answering their question. He says, when, what will be the sign? How are we going to know? And then he goes, uh, then, he says right here, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Um, what sign? Well, they're wanting to know when Jesus is going to come into his kingdom. And uh, a sign's kind of like a billboard. How are we going to know? How are we going to know that this, this has happened? And, uh, and will appear in heaven is really talking about Jesus taking his sitting on the throne. That he's going to, referring to that, the... the uh, setting in power and authority on um, in the new kingdom because that's what they were looking at they knew that things were going to change so they were looking for this new kingdom the destruction of jerusalem was the sign that jesus was sitting on the throne and the new kingdom was indeed in place and jesus is ruling over his eternal kingdom so they want they wanted to know what's the sign of this new kingdom and jesus said the sign will be and he didn't say, he said, the sign of this. He didn't say Jesus was coming back. He said, the sign of the Son of Man. So we're not talking about him coming back. We're talking about the sign. And, uh, and that when you see this, when you just see the destruction in Jerusalem, when you see the temple destroyed, you will know that I have come into my kingdom. You'll know that it's the beginning. This is the sign that I'm going to give you. So you'll know that I'm actually sitting on the throne in heaven. Um, one of the illustrations they used that I thought was good, back in um, 1945 when they dropped the atomic bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, you know, actually more, there was more Jews killed during this time than there was during, during that. But uh, it was a sign to Japan that the war was over. Because when those bombs fell, they knew they, it was over. You know, it was a sign to them. 
it was the signal to the Japanese that they couldn't, you know, and the war wasn't over. They could still have been fighting, but they knew when that happened that they were, there was no hope. And so, you know, a sign can be just something that tells you, okay, this is, this is a change. And when the temple was destroyed, and this happened, just as Jesus said, I want you to know the old kingdom, the old mosaic law, the sacrifices, all of that, that's done. It's over, and I am now reigning in heaven. Remember when Stephen saw, uh, when he was being stoned, and he, he looked up and he saw Jesus. He saw he's had a, kind of an open vision of Jesus, and Jesus was actually standing up. He was not sitting down yet. And he was still in that place of getting ready to take his authority and sit down. And then in later scriptures, you know, it talks about him seated on the, on the throne. There was this, this transfer from the old uh, kingdom, the old way that they were doing, to this new kingdom. And he was telling his disciples, how are you going to know there's the new kingdom in place? Because they, the, they didn't know how it was going to look is when these things happened. And so that was the sign. Um, then it, and then it says, you know, all the tribes of the, and of the land, and that's a, the Greek word there is a gay. looks like gi, but I guess it's gay. And it refers to the land. And it says that the, all the tribes of the land will mourn. Well, the, if you look at the tribes of Israel, the Jewish people, they mourned as they saw their temple destroyed. There was a mourning. And plus just all the people that were killed. The land was full of people mourning as, the, as this destruction happened. So then we go on to the, to the second part of that scripture when it says in verse 30. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great authority. Um, remember that Jesus is talking prophetic vocabulary. And so, you know... It, we have a tendency to read this and just make it very literal or we use our own way of thinking and we've been talking about you have to let the Bible interpret the Bible to understand the Bible. And so he's talking, and plus he's talking to Jewish people. They're understanding his language. They're used to this uh, apocalyptic kind of uh, idioms and, and phrases and, and all that. So there he's talking to them. So I want to read from this book. Um... Throughout the Old Testament, when God was going to bring destruction upon a city or nation, it was said that he would come on the clouds in the sky. In Jewish culture, the phrase, sign of your coming, had little to do with location and arrival. It was understood to mean coming in judgment upon a city or nation. Thus we find coming on the clouds is imagery throughout the Old Testament prophecies of judgment. When Isaiah prophesied Egypt's destruction, he pictured God riding on a cloud to bring judgment. And in Isaiah 19.1, A prophecy against I Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt with fear. In Psalm 18, a, a similar uh, use of the terminology, he is showing, God is, is shown having a dark cloud under his feet. His judgments go forth as dark storm clouds with hailstones and lightning. And in Psalm 104, the clouds are called God's chariot. And he is riding forth into battle on the wings of the wind. In Joel 2.2, 2, the day of the Lord is is imaged as a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Zephaniah echoes this imagery in his prophecy of the Lord word for word. And when speaking of God's judgment of the guilty, Nahum says, the clouds are the dust of his feet. Clearly the clouds are Old Testament symbolism for God's vehicle to come in judgment against a nation or city. Now, I know we've used this, you know, he's coming in the clouds. That's how he's going to come. But when you read this in context with this judgment, when it says the son, the son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, it's talking about coming 
with judgment. Not talking about his return. It's talking about a, that God is going to have judgment and that, that there's judgment coming upon a city. You know, if we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Then it goes on to say, And he will send his angels with great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, or the chosen ones, the, the believers, from, from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Um, everything changed when, when Jesus came into his kingdom. And the blowing of the trumpet, what it meant to Jews, was that there was a new royal decree coming out. Not actually a blowing of a trumpet, but there's a decree coming. And the decree, what it was, is now salvation comes to anyone who will receive it. It's no longer, the Jewish people were no longer the, cho the chosen people to take the message. Now this was a, an open invitation. Jesus said, you know, go into all the world. It was a new decree, a blowing of the trumpet, uh, the king, that now salvation was going to the Gentiles, to anyone. And so, uh, praise God. And the, the word there, gather, is significant. It literally means to synagogue. So when he's talking about gathering, now the decree is to bring people to the new synagogue the new temple of God, the church. And so when you begin to understand it, you see that he's calling, calling that the angels went forth, it was the decree, uh, and we saw that happen because now it's went out, and there's a, where's the synagogue now? Where's the temple of God now? It's in the church, it's inside of us. And so that was uh, a change. When he came into his kingdom, it was before the way that they would come is they had to go into the temple. And that's where they met God, and now that's changed. That all changed when Jesus, uh, as, as our new uh, king, has made way for each one of us to come. And then Matthew 24, 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches have already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no longer, will no means pass away. So here's Jesus. He's reemphasizing, and he says it right here. All these things are going to happen to this generation. And, he, and who is he talking to? Who's listening to him? Whose generation is he speaking these things? And when you see that, you know, he's, he's just saying again, this is going to happen. And history bears it out. It happened just like Jesus said. In AD 70, the, the, the army surrounded like he said. He said, don't go to the, when you see this, run to the hills. You know, they did that. They escaped. They were, they were saved. Uh, they, this destruction came. And the judgment came, he says, on the clouds, the sun of man will appear. That was the judgment. You'll see the sun and moon, uh, those things darken. Well, he's talking about Jerusalem. That light's going out, and it happened, just like he said. I mean, if you was in a court of law, and you had the preponderance of evidence, this is off the chart. I mean, it's like, he is way. You know, and you could even take it to the criminal level. You know, civil is just a little bit. Criminal is beyond the, sh uh, uh, the shadow of doubt. I mean, we're, we're really pushing when you have proof that all these things happened. And he says, this generation, did Jesus lie? You know, so you have to really look, begin to see. Well, if he said it is, it is. And so, you know, and he talks about this parable. And people make things about that. He's, you know, parable, one of the rules of interpreting parables is there's a simple truth that's trying to get across. Yeah, sometimes there's some other little things, but the simple truth is saying, when you see this happening, you know, when the, when the leaves are, you know, it's like when the end of summer, when the leaves change, guess what's coming? You know, winter. And so he's just saying, when you see these things happen, it's going to happen right away. And it's not going to happen, you know, 2,000 years on down. It's going to happen in this generation. And so, you know, he's saying that, 
And he says, this is, you know, assuredly, assuredly is like, listen. You know, it's, it's almost like grabbing your kid by their face. Listen, listen to me. This is important. This generation will not pass away till all these things come to pass. And then he says, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth, that phrase right there, referred to the temple. Because the Jewish people believed that that's where heaven and earth met. And it was, a, it was another phrase that, you know, heaven and earth will pass away. What? The temple's going to pass away. And, but my word will not. What I'm telling you, it will stand. It will last. And we also have proof of that because look at us here today. It was because of his word that we've seen the church increase and grow. And so uh, you begin to see this. It begins to make a whole lot of, of sense. So I'm going to end there. And we have five minutes for questions, comments, or just like deer in the headlight look. Whatever you, whatever you want to give me. Anybody have anything they want to share? Everybody's so quiet. I have a yes. Okay. Yeah. Who would have known that had you not read that book and told us that? Yeah. 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 Well, it's not, it wasn't put in there to confuse you. It was put in there to confirm who he was. Mm -hmm. And so it proves that what he says comes to pass. Right. And not everything is about this generation. Mm -hmm. When we read something, we think, oh, we're the only generation. There's been, Jesus loved every generation right. up to this time. So he, he's writing to uh, you know, different generations. But there is stuff that, that is in there. It still has application to us. We don't follow false prophets. But we see what Jesus said actually came to pass like he says. It gives him credibility because it proves who he is and that his word is true. And when you have, you can have all kinds of prophets saying things like the futurist prophets have said, Jesus was coming back in 1988. Jesus was coming back. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, he's coming back, and uh, every eye will see him when he comes back. Uh, it says he's coming back with 10,000 of his saints. But some of the, the prophecies that people have used to say it's still to come has already happened. But yes, he is coming. So it confirms his word that, he, that he's true, uh, and it shows this, his, his, he's a credible that he's credible, and there is personal application that we can use. Like, even though that happened, it said, don't look for me in the desert. There was a group of people out of this church that went down to Arizona because they thought Jesus was coming in the <laughs> desert. And so you know those things aren't true, but it brings credibility. And one of the things that, that the word, when we teach is we're, if you wouldn't have known about Jesus until somebody told you. Well, it's just like any truth or doctrine in the Bible, you have to be taught, you know, that there's a trinity, God's three parts. Now, all of this stuff we learn, that's why we have 
we have teachers. But yes, Jesus is coming back and there's lots of literal application that he, you know, and he says that our position in Christ, he loves us he, and he lives on the inside of us. When we accept Jesus, we're brand new creatures. And there's a lot of the New Testament that writes about all of that. But they were also writing about what was happening to those people at that time. Because it was a change of power. We were coming from Old Testament to New Testament. Right. The way I took it as like the new kingdom was like now is a spiritual kingdom. It's working itself out. Our salvation inside like our hearts. The spiritual kingdom works itself mm -hmm. out. See that well, the kingdom came into place, and when you when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are instantly changed on the inside. That you're a brand new creature on the inside, and you and what we're what we're learning to do is learning to find out about this kingdom, because we don't know everything. I mean, it's like yeah. we're we're finding out. Hey, we we've got we have a He's given us authority. He's given us healing. He's given us, and so even though we have been given all that, we have to learn about it, and learn to walk that out. But the neat thing is, the way Jesus set it up, is that we always have communication with him. Even though we might think, man, we don't know everything, and we're still learning and we make big mistakes, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have that connection to him all, every step of the way. From the time we say, yes, Jesus, that kingdom lives on the inside of us, and he just wants to teach us what we've got. And it became everyone that's like after Jesus. Everyone that received him. Right. Everybody still has a choice. Yeah. So, okay. Anybody, other comments? Questions? That's good because we're right at the dismissal time. But if you have any questions at all, you know, um, uh, it says that, uh, you know, we're, we're learning and growing and we're moving from glory to glory. And he's revealing his word to us. So if you have any questions or anything, don't ever hesitate to ask or think, well, how does this work or how's that? Um, but he brings us into freedom where we don't have to fear the future. We don't have to be afraid of the future. Uh, he's got a good plan for us. And uh, we learn how to take authority. When we know he's given us something good, then we know that what his will is. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you we th for your presence. We love you. We thank you that you're just revealing your truth to us. We thank you for this time together. Thank you for an opportunity just to look into your word. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.